its imposing head office building exudes financial strength. Inside, smartly dressed company representatives pitch an impressive list of international investments and the promise of high returns. Anbang Insurance has mushroomed into a $315 billion giant. And it's done that with a series of highly publicized but often risky international investments. That's landed it in the crosshairs of Chinese regulators. We will constantly strengthen the government's internal reforms and self-improvement. The company's assets are spread all over the world and include well-known brands like the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The government seized control of all these assets for at least a year. Its restructuring drive could put many of these up for sale. And the group's founder has been arrested on charges of fraud and embezzlement. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese invested their savings in Anbang. Market analysts say contenders are already swooping in to buy out these properties. The prices they pay will determine whether the people who invested in Anbang will laugh all the way to the bank or go bankrupt. Mubi Nasser, TRT World. Let's get more on this now with John Hemmings, who joins me now live from London. He's the director of the Asia Studies Centre at the Henry Jackson Society. Great to have you on the show, John. Uh, welcome. Why has the Chinese government taken such drastic action? Is Anbang too big to fail? Well, we've seen uh, over the past two years a real shift uh, in Chinese uh, state acceptance uh, over, over this kind of uh, go west, you know, go go global policy that would previously existed for Chinese companies um, since about I guess 2016, when they really saw a huge outflow of Chinese investment, um, the government became much more skittish about it and started to put down uh, higher regulations on on what they could uh, you know invest in and what they couldn't. Uh, Anbang, um, it was an interesting case. They're very high, highly connected in terms of politically. Um, I believe uh, Wu uh, Xiaohui is, is married to Deng Xiaoping's uh, granddaughter, so that would be, you know, someone quite high up. It was a previous Chinese leader. Um, but, you know, they ran too fast, too quickly, and they burned through a lot of their assets. And they were also, I think, if I understand correctly, I mean, they, they were raising a lot of their financing through shadow banking, which, you know, the, the central government became very, very skeptical about. John, how do you read this? Do you read this as a genuine crackdown on corruption and, and, and shady lending practices, or is there a political element to all of this? There, there could be a political element. I mean, there is the sense that um, perhaps, uh, you know, Wu was affiliated too much with the Deng people. But I, I think you could read it both ways without too much discomfort. I mean, the fact is that the Chinese state... Um, I believe they had three trillion in reserves. They saw a trillion of that uh, lost in, in very rapid form after the 2014 uh, stock market cr um, kind of freeze. And so they became very worried about how much money ha was be leaving the country. So what they've done is really crack down on these four uh, big conglomerates, uh, H&A, Dalian Wanda, um, and of course, uh, Anbang and, and Fosan International. And th those, four, those four companies actually comprised, uh, I think, a fifth of all outgoing acquisitions in 2017. So controlling those four companies became, uh, according to some insiders, not just an economic strategy, but also a strategy for national security. Ah, so that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Because in answer to my original question then, the Anbang and these other companies that you mentioned genuinely do pose a systemic risk to China's economic system, then? I think so. I mean, we have to remember the Chinese have tracked uh, what happened to Japan. You know, Japan in the 1980s uh, was in a, in a similarly hubristic and optimistic mood. It was buying ass assets uh, right across uh, the West. Often it was leveraging um, itself by putting out uh, high-yield short-term bonds, and, and then these were racking up debts. Um, China's national debt is, is about 300 percent of GDP. You know, China has a lot to worry about. It doesn't want to have a kind of lost decades that Japan, uh, you know, kind of has suffered in the wake of that 
1980 shopping spree. So I think Xi Jinping's, uh, and I definitely think this is related to him, this policy is to essentially uh, slow down and control those um, buying sprees and make sure that the Chinese state is directing them much more. OK. In short, then, do you think China is doing enough to remedy this situation? It's always going to be difficult. I think it, it will be putting more pressure. I mean, after this arrest, it's a very significant event in, in the corporate uh, world in China. I think this will have a, a very deep impact. However, whether it has an overall impact on China's uh, debt right. to GDP ratio, I think they have to reform their economy for that. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. John Hemmings of the Henry Jackson Society in London, thank you very much indeed.